Hello and welcome to worship for Sunday, August the 22nd. I am so grateful to be with you today. This is the first Sunday that I am back after a long sabbatical. I am feeling grateful to everyone who has helped to contribute and to and support the ministry here at the church in my absence. I'm feeling particularly grateful to my colleague, the Reverend Carla Wilkes, for her part in that. And I'm really grateful that Carla is getting some time for rest and renewal for herself uh, over these weeks. And uh, it is good to be back. And I am ready to be um, facing into with you to the fall and whatever it may come our ways. Uh, I am grateful to be here. I want to begin by just sharing a brief announcement about uh, gathering together. So we have a plan to gather at Kate's Park Way Abachin uh, here for those who live in this area on the long weekend, the Labor Day weekend on Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, but we need you to sign up for that. Uh, North Van Parks and Recs is being quite strict about uh, holding fast to a number of 50 people. And so there are spaces for 50 of you to bring your lawn chairs and gather with us and then bring a lunch with you to share with your with your family. We'll break bread together, but uh, in individual ways. And uh, you can find the details to register for that and sign up for that in the e-news that's attached to this service. For those of you who may be tuning in for the very first time to our worship service, and for those of you who are used to gathering in this place and with this community, I want to say welcome. The welcome that we extend in this place is always as broad and as deep as we can make it, so you are welcome here, no matter how young or how old you may be. You are welcome, whatever your marital status is, your sexual orientation or gender identity. You're welcome, whatever your ethnic or cultural heritage is, your financial background. You're welcome, whether you consider yourself to be a Christian or you're part of another faith tradition. We welcome everyone in this place who seeks to explore the mysteries of life and live by the ideals of justice and compassion. And because we are a justice-seeking people, uh, one of the things that we do when we gather in this place is we acknowledge that we are located, our church is located on the traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. And uh, if you, like me, have been listening to the way that Carla has been um, acknowledging the land over this last stretch of time, you will have heard her talk about the way that uh, the indigenous peoples of this land have been stewarding this territory for uh, a long, long time, long before Jesus walked on the face of the earth. I found myself wondering just how long that was uh, as I listened to her say that. And so I looked it up, and uh, what I found was that there have been indigenous people the first time that uh, there was known to be indigenous people on this land was uh, 9,000 before Common Era or before Christ. So that is a very, very long, long time in history that this land has been cared for by uh, the Coast Salish peoples. And so we are very, very grateful to be able to worship together, to be able to uh, work and serve and to play on this very beautiful land. Let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts, our minds, and our bodies to be together in worship. A long time ago, Jesus walked the dusty roads and lakeside paths of Galilee. He told stories, he healed the sick, and he cared for the poor. He challenged the powerful. And those who followed him were amazed by his wisdom, they were touched by his compassion, and they were changed by his presence. 
and once when they asked him who he was, he said, I am the light of the world. As we light the Christ candle in the sanctuary of the church, we invite you to light a candle in your home. May this light remind us of the way we are connected, even when we are apart. May, May the, the warmth, warmth of its glow draw into, into the goodness of God's love and care. Today's scripture reading will come to us from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And uh, in that uh, epistle in the, our Bibles, we hear some of the most beautiful words and metaphors for our life in the spirit and our life in the church, our life with God. Uh, one of the things that the apostle Paul says in that letter is that he desires that we might be strengthened in our inner being with power through the Spirit, and that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith as we are being rooted and grounded in love, and that we might know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of that love. And so I invite you to take a moment now and just to allow yourself to imagine that you are being grounded and rooted 
in a deep and abiding love as we come together in prayer. Everlasting One, root us deeply in your love. Clothe us with your life-giving power that we might be strong enough and wise enough to protect what is most precious in our lives, that we might withstand all that threatens to deter, distract, and derail us from our task of bearing your light to the world. Make our hearts ready to listen and to hear your word of hope for our lives this day. Restore us once again to the fullness of life as you intended to be, that we might rise ready to serve our world with commitment and grace. Amen. Whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the meaning they hold for you on this day. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. Finally, draw your strength from Christ and from the strength of that mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand firm against the tactics of the devil. Our struggle ultimately is not against human forces, but against the sovereignties and powers, the rulers of the world of darkness, and the evil spirits of the heavenly realms. You must put on the whole armor of God if you are to resist on the evil day and, having done everything you can, to stand firm. Stand fast then, with truth as the belt around your waist, justice as your breastplate and zeal to spread the good news of peace as your footgear. In all circumstances, hold faith up before you as your shield. It will help you extinguish the fiery darts of the evil one. Put on the helmet of salvation and carry the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Always pray in the Spirit with all your prayers and petitions. Pray constantly and attentively for all God's holy people. Pray also for me that God will open my mouth and put words on my lips, that I may boldly make known in the mystery of the good news, that mystery for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may have courage to proclaim it as I ought. May, may God, God bless us with, with wisdom and wonder, wonder as, as we, we ponder the, the meaning of these words for our lives. lives. Last week, when I decided that it was time for me to start thinking about what I was going to preach about on this first Sunday back in the pulpit post-sabbatical, I took a look at the lectionary to see what the assigned scripture readings were for today, the readings that priests and pastors and lay people all over the world will be praying over and reflecting on in worship this week. And I have to say that after doing that, I was left feeling pretty uninspired, especially uninspired by the reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians that we've just heard read. Who wants to be talking about wearing helmets and breastplates and carrying swords and shields in all this heat that uh, we've been having this summer? All that military language and all that stuff about spiritual warfare and the power of evil that comes from such an old dualistic way of looking at the world, at least in my opinion, well, it just drained the life right out of me. But then I sat with what for me was a challenging reading. I sat with it a little bit longer and I did some research and I came to realize that this is a text about defending and protecting those things in our lives that are worth fighting for, that are worth the struggle. Of all the military gear that's described in this passage, 
only the sword is a potentially offensive piece of equipment. And even then, it's the sword of the spirit. So how much damage are we really going to inflict on one another brandishing that kind of weapon? All the other pieces, the helmet, the breastplate, the shield, the belt, the shoes, all of them are meant to protect, to defend. And so I found myself wondering, what is it that I am trying to protect or defend these days? What's worth the struggle in my own life? Well, like many of you, I've been thinking a lot about things potentially opening up more this fall and how that might impact my life. Of all the questions for reflection that I've heard for those who, those of us who want to be thoughtful about what life in a post-pandemic world might be, uh, what's been life-giving for us, uh, questions like what's been life-giving for us during the pandemic, or what lessons have we learned, or what do we want to carry forward? The most interesting question that I've been asked is this one. What got cancelled during COVID that you secretly celebrated? What got cancelled during COVID that you secretly celebrated? I love this question because I think it has the potential to get at values that we hold dear, that we may not have realized were as dear to us as they are. It's possible, for example, that we value a less hectic pace in our day-to-day -day lives than we realized, even those of us who have lamented losing a lot of our activities over this last stretch of time. It's possible that we value more quiet time than we realize. I can remember talking to one person who said she feels like she's become like a bit of a monk during the pandemic, and maybe that's not such a bad thing. It's possible that we didn't value getting together with our families for Christmas dinner as much as we thought we did. Unfortunately for me, one of the things I've discovered that I value is not working on weekends. Unfortunate because I actually get paid to work on weekends. And so I had to ponder that dilemma for a while, you know, I wasn't going to quit my job. I had to think about that until I realized that what I really value about not working on weekends is having more time with my family. And so one of the things I want to protect when we return to in-person worship on Sunday mornings is time with my family. And I know that that's going to be a struggle for me at times. It's going to be an inner battle as much as an outer battle. And I know I'm going to need to stand firm in my convictions if I'm to guard that value. But I also know that the struggle will be worth it. Something else that most of us are guarding these days is our health and the health of our community, the health of our loved ones. This spring, I had an experience in which I found out through casual conversation that someone we had welcomed into our home had not been vaccinated, nor were they planning to ever get vaccinated. And although I reacted pretty calmly in the moment when I was face to face with that person, shortly after they left my house, I went pretty ballistic. <laughs> And I was so caught off guard at the strength of my reaction, the aggression that I felt, that I had to get in touch with what that was about for me. I realized that I felt really protective of all of you who have given up so much to keep each other safe, so much so that I found myself going on the attack about it. And I know that I'm not alone in those strong feelings. In the last few weeks, I've had people tell me about relationships with hairdressers and house cleaners, Facebook friends and members of their own families that they have ended because of differing views on the need for vaccinations. 
And if you're paying attention to the federal election campaign, and I hope that you are, you will know how quickly the issue of whether or not employees are required to be vaccinated has become a political wedge issue. When it comes to protecting what we value most, we can very easily make the shift from defensive to offensive behavior. We can very easily go from putting on the foot gear of zeal to share good news of peace and the sword of the spirit of Christ to launching verbal grenades at one another and literally cutting people out of our lives. In Ojibwe author Richard Wagamizi's last book, the one containing his final writings before his death, he talks about the way our world so often draws out our differences, creating separation between us. And he refers to ancient prophecies from his people that speak of a time when the human family would move farther apart and how this separation, this break in energy, would cause great stress upon the earth. This time, the ancient prophecies said, would be marked by flood, drought, titanic storms, famine, earthquakes, the departure of animals, strange diseases, and turmoil among peoples. But the Ojibwe ancestors also predicted that there would be a time when humanity would return to teachings that draw us together instead of pushing us apart. And Richard Wagamese says that because of this, we need to deliberately work at harmony. The belt of truth around our waist is that we can't be in harmony with one another when we are wearing the boots of division, when we are lobbing fiery darts of fierce judgment at one another. And so the hardest thing from Paul's reading today, from his letter to the Ephesians, may just be the call to stand firm in our convictions, to guard our values around health, and healing, peace, truth, justice, and harmony, while at the same time shielding ourselves from our own propensity to lash out at one another in hurtful or in harmful ways, in divisive ways, when our values are being challenged. And perhaps that's why Paul ends this passage with the imperative to pray always to stay connected to Christ, to draw our strength from the power of love so that we might withstand our human inclination to get caught up in powers that destroy, divide, and demonize what Paul refers to as the tactics of the devil. The reality is that there is evil in the world, People do unspeakable things to one another and to creation. We need look no further than the ovens of Auschwitz, Auschwitz or the intergenerational trauma resulting from residential schools, our burning forests, or the images that are still fresh in our minds of Afghani citizens clinging to the outside of an airplane, risking, and in some cases losing their lives, because the alternative, living under the rule of the Taliban, was experienced by them as too much evil to face. There is evil in the world, but we also need to be cautious about dualistic kinds of thinking and thinking that we can easily determine what's good and bad and right and wrong. It's important to understand that part of what the Apostle Paul is addressing in today's passage is what we know as systemic evil, the way that we as human beings can create and can get caught up in and live out of systems that are harmful, often without even realizing it. 
it's important that we learn to recognize and stand firm against this kind of systemic evil. Because once we get caught up in personifying and demonizing one another as individuals, I think there's precious little hope of redemption and little hope of harmony. Yesterday, I heard an interview with retired Colonel Jamie Hammond, who served for the Canadian Army in Afghanistan for many years. Despite the horrific images coming out of the country this week, his message was one of uh, surprising hope. Unlike me and many others who were ready to demonize the Taliban and to declare the entire situation in the country a lost cause, he pointed out that Canadian soldiers and their Afghani counterparts have stood firm in their convictions for almost 20 years their convictions that literacy and women's education and health care and the dignity of each and every life should be available to everyone in the country. And he said that because of those convictions, because of those values that they have protected and defended and nurtured for almost 20 years, an entire generation has glimpsed a vision of peace and possibility for themselves and for their country. And he said we need to believe in their capacity to stand firm in those convictions in their country in these days. And I might add that we need to pray ceasingly for their capacity to do that. And so I'll ask the question once again, what was canceled due to COVID? that you secretly celebrated? And how does that help you know what you truly value? How might you protect that going forward? And what is it that you need to pray for always? My own hope is that one thing that has been permanently canceled in our world is any notion we may have that we are not inextricably connected to one another, because we are. And I pray that we may be given the grace and the strength to defend and to protect our planet and to defend and protect one another in peaceful and harmonious ways. I pray that the struggle to do so will be more than worth it. May it be so. Amen. Oh
We're going to create our prayers together today through some prompts that I will give you and through some moments of silence. So I invite you now to uh, close your eyes if you're wish, you wish or to soften your gaze. And let's begin by returning to that moment in this week when you felt most alive. Just go back to that time and allow yourself to feel again those feelings. Let them rise up in you again. To be aware of where you were and who you were with, if you were with someone, and what it is that you were experiencing. To feel inside of yourself that life giving feeling again. And to allow that that experience to form for you a prayer of gratitude. And I'm going to invite you now to return to a challenging moment in this week, something that was difficult for you, to bring that up in your memory and without needing to fix whatever that was just allow it to be again to access the feelings that you had and then when you've had a minute to get in touch with that. To invite a prayer to form from that experience. It might be a prayer for help or for strength. It might be a prayer of forgiveness or a prayer seeking grace. Maybe it's a prayer to put the experience behind you. And I invite you now in the quiet of this moment just to put your hand on your heart center. And to imagine that you are sending love and light out into the world. And let's begin by imagining that we are sending that love and goodness, that Christ power that is within us, out all the way across the world. We're sending it to Afghanistan. Sending it to the people who are frightened. Sending it to people of goodwill. And sending it to those who might be experienced as enemies. A prayer for peace. And let's send that love and strength and healing and hope to the people of Haiti. And imagine it traveling to them surrounding them in their fear and in their loss. So much devastation this week. 
We send a prayer for all the aid workers and people who are searching through rubble and trying to bring hope to those people. And now imagine that we are sending out love and light to the community that is around us. And wherever you may be, it may be that you're sending that love out to your next door neighbor, maybe to somebody going through a difficult time. Or it may be that you are in a place where the smoke is heavy, where the fires are burning, And maybe you yourself have been evacuated from your own home or you're on alert. I invite you still, even in that state, to receive love and light that's being sent your way, even as you send it out to others. One big exhale out of love and an inhale of love. We send that out now to the community that is our Earth family, to the planet and to all the amazing species of plant life and animal life that are our companions on this earth. So we feel a connection with all of them. And feel within ourselves a conviction to care for them. And I invite you now to think about those who are your community, who are nearest and dearest to your hearts, your family, your very close friends, and in particular to send healing and grace-filled light and love to those you know who are in particular need of it. In our own community of faith, we send that healing grace and we call upon the great source of healing, love, and power in our world. For Sanjay, and for Jim, and for Pat. May grace and healing, peace and justice, harmony and light, may it be with each one of us, and may it be with all who have an undying love of Christ and what we have been drawn to protect and defend in Christ's name. Amen. Invested power stand 
Let's go forth now with more words from the Apostle Paul from his letter to the Ephesians. Workers, work diligently and support one another with the respect and sincere loyalty that you owe to Christ. Don't render your servants for appearance sake or only to please others, but do God's will with your whole heart as Christ's own workers. Give your service willingly. And now to God, whose power at work within us can do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. To God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, world without end. Amen. I'm 
going to love so God can use me and a well award anytime I'm going to sing so love so God can use me and a well award anytime I'm going to live I'm going to live so God can use me and a well